in the middle. So, uh, that was the south against the north. Yeah. The, uh, the, 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 the precedence of persons are the things. And, and how the things in Homer... Uh, I, I just turned to this passage that you, in book six, uh, where uh, uh, he Hecuba comes and tries to stop Hector from going. Andromache. I mean, and Andromache. We were just talking about Hector. He Hector is Priam's, Priam's wife. wife yeah. Andromache is Hector's wife. And, and um, I, I just, as I was looking at the passage, uh, uh, my eye picked up a, uh, a phrase of, of Hector's. Uh, he, he says, uh, and now I've lost the thing again, but he, but he says, uh, how can I, uh, how can I face uh, the women of Troy if I if I retreat from the fight in shame? But he, but he says, uh, he doesn't say the women of Troy. He says the women of Troy with their long robes. <laughs> They're trailing gowns, as it is in my translation. I'm going to have to do something about those animals. The sound effects on these tapes, I don't know whether they, <laughs> they come across. But, oh, yes, they but, do, uh, they do. I've heard some of them. We're munching a little bit on cheese and crackers here and drinking a, a little glass of wine. And, uh, occasionally you'll hear those, uh, those uh, tinkles, these sound effects <laughs> like that. And um, here we have these, these, these dogs, beasts, uh, crying away. And it's it's not a it's not a bad background to, <laughs> no, <not laughs> to what we're <laughs> not at all. No. We 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 thought we might uh, make these uh, tapes in a studio, <laughs> but that would be wrong. <laughs> Homer was never made for a studio, but it does distract you. What were we talking about? <laughs> Those Trojan ladies. <laughs> Trojan ladies. Trailing oh, that's why we fight, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's. But 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 uh, notice again that marvelous. Unity of the person and the thing. Uh, there are some poets <clears throat> who have nothing but trailing gowns, or nothing but gowns. They don't trail. They, they're just <laughs> gowns. That is, they're, they're costume poets. Uh, they talk about nothing but things, and their, the, the, their poems are, are about mannequins who wear clothes. Don't you think that's true about an awful lot of movies, for example? Yes, uh, yes. Really, that's... Right, uh, particularly the movies because they're they're so they're so uh, visually oriented uh, that the uh, uh, the people inside the the clothes uh, don't matter. Like if you ever saw uh, cases where clothes, as they say, make the man, <laughs> it's it's in the movies or or the woman. Uh, but that's certainly not true in uh, in Homer. The, uh, there are splendid uh, splendid garments, uh, but their splendor. Is uh, is related uh, to the to the people who wear them. It's it's the, the splendor is a kind of external manifestation of a splendor that resides in uh, in these these people themselves. And, that, and, and we care about those things. They become relics. <clears throat> that is, when someone has worn a piece of clothing, uh, that clothing uh, takes on it something of the life of the person. Uh, the, the, this is why in, in, the, in the church uh, we have uh, second class relics uh, isn't that what they're called or are they third class I can't remember the classifications but the, even the things that a saint has touched uh, somehow have a, have a grace uh, and that's true in the secular order as well uh, it is a, a, a wonderful thing uh, to gaze uh, uh, on those things that archaeologists dig up and to think of the great ladies that wore them. Well, it's it's a great <coughs> thing to go to these places, uh, just just to go to be in this place, uh, to be where uh, where Hector stood, where Achilles stood, uh, where Agamemnon uh, lived, uh, to to even be in the <coughs> uh, whether you're in the exact place or not. It's a very well, great thing. Reading over that catalog of ships and trying to pronounce those names. Uh, and I, I really do regret sometimes that I hadn't uh, mastered Greek uh, and, and really learned how to read those things with ease, but I, I can't. It slows me down to, to look at them all. Most of them are strange, but I, I came on one of them, uh, which is, of course, very famous. Uh, in the catalog of ships there, in book two, Homer says, and then there were those that came from Tyrans. 
Yes. And you remember, we, we yes. did go there. Yes. Yes. And we stood in that marvelous place. And uh, my most vivid memory of Turin's, uh, we, we went there with a group of students, and uh, we, we did a lot of walking, because for some reason, uh, it was close enough to somewhere else, so the bus didn't drive us. And so the, the guide said, well, we'll just walk. And it was, a, it was a mile or so, or maybe more, I forget. It was a long walk. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I can remember so vividly uh, going through uh, orange groves. Mm -hmm. And we were there in, in, in the orange season, uh, when, the orange, when the fruit was ripe on the trees. And these marvelous little children came up to us. And they offered us uh, ripe golden oranges. Tyrants for me will always be uh, 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 Marvel calls them uh, 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 golden lamps in a green night uh, in, in one of his poems. Oh, he calls oranges yeah. gold lamps in a green, green night. night. <laughs> the, the, the green night being the green tree. Uh, he'd never seen an orange <laughs> tree, but that doesn't. <laughs> you heard it. But he, but <laughs> he knew it. about it. Sorry. Uh, and uh, I always remember the, the little little children uh, with their bright faces, a smile offering this this marvelous gift and, and so Tyrans is a place it's a real place and uh, they were heroes who came from there and fought in the Trojan War and, I think and I, I think that Tyrans is the place that has the great wall with those cyclopean stones mm -hmm. I think I mean mm -hmm. wrong we I saw so many wonders so we, many, yes. it's not far uh, from Mycenae yeah, and it may be yeah. that we walk from uh, Mycenae to Tyrion one of the other uh, the places yeah. you know those those the, walls the great were, archaeological were, uh, were built by the by the Cyclops <laughs> <laughs> uh, before Odysseus ever ever uh, met them they mm -hmm. they were uh, they were put to work and they hewed those vast stones mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, yards thick. That only a cyclops uh, could have lifted. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, it's just amazing to see those things, and you uh, you look at them, and they have been hewn. Those stones have been hewn out, uh, and you realize that you're in the presence of uh, of those great uh, men, those great beings of the past. Uh, and and I and I would still insist that you're. You're in the presence of these these marvelous beings of the present. Uh, that is, these, yes. these wonderful children uh, who, yes. who hand you the oranges. That, that is, it's not the dead past. It's it's not no. the past of a museum. No, uh, it's not the past of a, of a, of a, of a library. That, that dead thing. I don't know. We we spent so much of our lives around universities, and the thing that's kept us alive has always been the students, okay. and, uh, and not the libraries. Uh, uh, not not that uh, uh, not the mausoleums uh, of, of culture. No, oh, I know. I remember uh, once uh, in that area, going up on top of the hill, and it was some sort of famous hill. Uh, I, I forgot what the occasion was, but I remember uh, the thing that I remember about that was hearing the sheep bells. Mm -hmm. uh, you could hear them uh, even before you could see the shepherds and their sheep. But you looked down from this hill, and there were the shepherds, and there were the sheep. Uh, they were, uh, they were, uh, they were, they were uh, the same shepherds and the same sheep that were there in the time of uh, Homer. They had nothing, nothing can really change. You'd say they, they were uh, still Greeks out there, uh, very simple people, uh, herding their sheep with those uh, those bells that uh, that surely were were uh, this, making the same sound in the ears of Agamemnon. Mark Van Doren has a good line in, in one of his poems. He says. Everything passes. Now, if we stop there, we'd say, "Well, <laughs> yeah. he 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 picked that up from a famous place." But he, but the line goes, "Everything passes, even change." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And again, that's that's a, that's a paradox. That's a, that's a, that's a piece of wit. But it, but it's true. Uh, uh, sure, uh, Troy is is dust. Uh, but but past ruin. Iliad, Helen lives, uh, and uh, uh, the sheep are still grazing on those hillsides, and there are still uh, Greek uh, children eating oranges, offering gifts. Beware of uh, Greeks bearing gifts, uh, we're told, by the Trojans. That's, that's a line from the, from the Aeneid. Uh, the Greeks are tricky people, aren't they?
Mm -hmm. uh, they were, uh, I, I think the students were just overwhelmed. They, they thought perhaps these little kids were trying to, uh, to sell, uh, sell them the oranges, but they had no intention of selling them any oranges. They never asked for a thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, they, they actually invited the uh, students to go out and pick oranges in, mm -hmm. the, uh, in, the, in this uh, orange grove. It's uh, hard to imagine that happening. You can't imagine that happening in the United States at all. Yeah, <laughs> it's right, impossible. Right. They will be filled with yeah. poisons yeah. and barbed wire fences. And yeah. Well, they were so thrilled, machine. really. The, yeah. uh, the, those little children were, were as thrilled with with us as yeah. we were with them. Yes. Well, we were a wonder to them. Yeah, yeah. All, these, all, these, all these young uh, men and women. That's what uh, was so startling to them. Out and all walking up some along. damn hill, you yeah. know, too, you know. <laughs> yeah, going to see some damn old rocks that have been, <laughs> been over there forever. <laughs> The, uh, the archaeologist gets, gets angry at us when we talk this way. Uh, the, uh, the Department of Archaeology, as it were, uh, it gets angry because they say, well, the purpose of going to Tiryns would be to study the ruins and to learn the facts about it and to, to learn the theories and, and so on. And we would say, well, when we came back from those places, we had vivid memories of children giving us oranges and they would just throw up their hands and say well what, why did you go you know why did you go and we'd say well that's 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 why we went because what we're what we're saying is well you, well, you got us started on this we were talking about the relation of person and things and you had mentioned places yeah, yeah. The, 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 uh, the these these people uh, have, have given a, a meaning to the places themselves and the places are still alive the, uh, I think the greatest archaeologists, of course, did, oh, always know that. Certainly Schliemann, for example, did. Uh, uh, Heinrich Schliemann is the, is the guy who 100 years ago first decided that Homer was telling the truth and who went and, and uh, on the basis of a poem figured out where, he, where Troy was and then just simply started to dig and he dug up Troy. The trouble is he, drew, he dug up seven or eight of them. <laughs> and there's been a con more controversy ever since. Uh, but still, uh, what a wonderful man he was. And well, his, his interest in Troy was not the interest of an archaeologist. I mean, he's sometimes considered to be something like the father of modern archaeology, or at least classic archaeology. Although uh, modern archaeologists are ashamed of Schliemann. He was, an, he was an amateur. And I was just going to say that that his motivation uh, was a was love. Uh, he, he loved uh, the poems of Homer. Uh, he knew them by heart, and uh, he believed that, that they had to be true. He, he was convinced that they were true stories. And at that time, uh, the the scholars all disbelieved the truth of those stories. They said, "Oh, these are just fictions that were made up, and they uh, they have no basis in truth at all in history." And, uh, they had anthropological uh, theories yeah. about why yeah. uh, people would make them up. But uh, Schliemann was convinced they were true, and he, 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 he went out to prove they were true. And since then, really, nobody has denied the truth of them. Even if they disagree about uh, whether this is Troy or that, or you know, which layer Troy is in in, the, in, the, in these diggings and, and all of that, and whether this is really uh, Agamemnon's bathtub uh, <laughs> that he discovered because uh, he... Uh, and he, he dug, dug up all of those marvelous things, and um, but I, I say he was an amateur. That is someone uh, who, who was in love uh, with these things. That's what the word means. That's what amateur the word comes means. from. From almost an amateur and, and an expert. Uh, an expert is not a not a lover. Uh, he he's someone who is intensely interested. Uh, which is a different thing. It has, again, that objectivity about it. If you say, well, I'm very interested in, uh, in uh, Greek poetry, it doesn't mean the same as saying that you love uh, Greek poetry or you love the things that are, that are there. Uh, and, and then the persons. And the persons uh, that are there. Uh, the, uh, I remember somebody saying, I don't remember who it was, someone had, <coughs> in, a, in a university debate, uh, ages ago, someone had said, well, I think it was during the, the war, <clears throat> when the war broke out, I'm talking about the war, for me that means World War II. When, when the war broke out, I was in college, and the debate broke out, well, shouldn't we change the curriculum? Shouldn't we Shouldn't uh, we gear up for the war? Everything had to be for the war effort. And it was then said, well, let's just do away with poetry. You know, we have to get on with the things, the things that will help us win the war. 
Of course, that was silly, and, and, and that idea did not prevail. But but it did come up, and people did argue it that we should have only engineering, or only physics and chemistry and math, because they would help us win the war. And someone said, "Well, <coughs> what's the value of poetry anyway?" And I remember a, 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 one of the professors saying, "Well." Not to know poetry is, and then you got a catalog. You would never know Hector. You would never know Andromache. You would never know Deiphobus. And he went on and on and on and on, you know, and it was just overwhelming. Uh, that is, these are, are persons, and not to know them is never to have lived at all. It's just not not to not to know anything. Uh, you you wouldn't. What, what's the point of fighting a war, as Hector says? Yeah, well, a society that doesn't know Hector and Achilles and uh, and these Trojan ladies in their trailing gowns, uh, why in the world would they want to fight a war at all? Uh, they, uh, they might simply say, uh, and I think they would simply say, well, this is all meaningless. This is all just just mere slaughter. Well, hasn't that happened? I think it has happened. That, that is the fact is these poems are not known anymore these uh, these uh, these great persons are forgotten. John Lennon doesn't know Homer and that's why he says uh, nothing how did that go nothing to fight about nothing to you remember we yeah, were yeah, talking we about his, his, uh, his song imagine and he says yeah. imagine what a wonderful world would be when when there's, there's no oh, now I've forgotten no reason to give you life no, no reason for living, no reason for dying. I, thank God, I forgot how it goes. <laughs> but the meaning of, of what he said was, there wouldn't be any reason for fighting, because there isn't anything to fight for. Yeah. But if you, if you don't know these poems, uh, then of course there, there isn't any reason uh, to fight. Uh, this scene that we're talking about now, commenting on, and there go those animals again. You know, they, they, they believe this. Everything is to fight about. Uh, <laughs> the, the minute a, another dog comes within a mile of this place, those beasts set up an aggressive howl. <laughs> I have no idea what they're... <clears throat> I've done everything to please them. <laughs> we just have to stop and listen to them. <laughs> they're, they're saying something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, this scene is, uh, is is maybe the best scene in the whole film. Certainly, one that is is uh, is often often remembered, very often remembered. I, I when we speak of uh, things, I I always think of that the main thing in this in this uh, section is the helmet of Hector. Uh, he has a he has a helmet with a uh, crest on it. Great. Uh, Horsehair crest, and he uh, he's wearing it, and he, he's ready to go to because battle, he's yeah. ready to go off into battle, and uh, he he defends himself. That is, uh, she she Hector, Andromache really reproaches him, and he defends himself and defends the the whole idea of men having to go to war, and then uh, he uh, as he finished. Uh, glorious Hector held out his arms to take his boy, his his little child, his little infant child is there with the nurse. Uh, the nurse has the child in her arms, but the child shrank back with a cry to the bosom of his girdled nurse, alarmed by his, his father's appearance. He was frightened by the bronze of the helmet and the horsehair plume that he saw nodding grimly down at him. And then says his father and his lady mother had to laugh. Mm -hmm. They laugh. <laughs> laugh. And, and she has just been weeping. Yeah. Uh, she's been in tears. Uh, she knows she knows her husband is going to his death and she is going to be uh, she's going to be taken captive 
and uh, made a slave. Uh, she knows what her fate is, and he says it himself. He, he, uh, he realizes what her fate is going to be too, and he's, he's very deeply grieved about it, of course. Uh, but hey, uh, uh, the, the, uh, uh, that, uh, that helmet, uh, uh, he, he, he reaches to pick up the child, and the child uh, shrinks back and, and, and cries out in, in terror at the bronze helmet with the plume on it and, the, and there uh, young Hector and his wife just like any other ordinary uh, parents uh, have to laugh they say they have to laugh at the uh, little child afraid of that and then he takes it off yeah he takes it off <laughs> puts it down uh, so that the child <clears throat> won't be afraid well uh, Andromache's argument against war it is as well stated as it can be stated, as it ever has been stated. That is today, when uh, pacifists uh, demonstrate in front of nuclear arms plants and whatnot, uh, at their best, and they're not very frequently, alas, anywhere near their best, but at their best, they simply repeat the same arguments. That is, she says, uh, you know what's wrong with war? People get killed. That's what's wrong. With it. If you go out there and fight, you're going to get killed. And I will be left alone. And our baby will be left alone. And there'll be nobody to love us and nobody to take care of us. That is, the only argument against war is, and it's, it's undeniable, uh, there's no way of fighting a war without getting killed. <laughs> that's, you know, that's it. And you, you can say, well, I won't get killed. Uh, well, Hector's not as <laughs> stupid as to believe that. You know that I just read the other day, there's a... Uh, uh, did, did, you re did you know that there was a very uh, concerted effort uh, at the beginning of World War II to, to get all the poets exempted from service. No. Oh, it was very serious. It had. Uh, I, I read a review of the book that went through this whole matter. It, it, it's really it's it's comic, but it's it was very serious. All of the a was great that Archibald McLeish or somebody. No, it wasn't. Or, no, it was the British. They just was oh, the British. British. Oh, in England. Now, you yeah. see, in England during World War World War One, all, all the great poets, all the great poets were killed during That's World War One. Yeah. A whole generation of young poets were killed, mm -hmm. and when World War Two came up. Uh, all the artists got up in arms and they said, we're going to protect the, the artists, the poets, the musicians. They got into a little trouble because they, they decided to exclude the architects <laughs> and the sculptors. They left out the sculptors too. But they picked out all the, the up and coming ones and they, they put them on a list. And they and and it is a name. They, they are names on there of, of, of men who became, who became really famous. quite famous poets. Um, uh, but it, it, it lost, of course. They uh, it it was it was uh, turned down. The the Ministry of War said, no, we can't do that. We just we can't. Ex why should we exempt the poets? You know, and really, we just can't do that. And of course, the outcome was that none of them was killed. <laughs> not not one of the well, not one of those people that was mentioned was killed during the war. No. Well, uh, for example, now farmers were exempted. Yeah, and, and they and they and they had to be. Yeah, and, yeah, and 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 they they were they were. A man about it. They didn't want to be accepted. They, well, they wanted to fight. But uh, but the, the state said, well, we have to eat, so somebody has to plant the crops and so on. So that if, I remember that distinctly, that uh, it was one of the grounds for exemption. If you were the only one uh, capable of running a farm or something like that, that you, 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 wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't be taken for the draft. But the idea that the poets would be exempted, that's just a yeah. Well, they want to put them in, in the desk jobs, you know, and uh, keep them uh, safe behind the lines. <laughs> now, <laughs> women were exempted. <laughs> yes. Women uh, and children. Yes. yes. And God help us, that's no longer true. No, I mean, in the, in the, in the, in the next war. I, I can remember uh, talking to German soldiers in, in World War II, uh, prisoners of, of war, uh, who said that uh, they were so pleased to be captured by the, by the uh, Americans because, and I remember these, these German soldiers saying with their eyes just you know, 
wide with wonder uh, on the uh, on the eastern front. Uh, do you know what those Russians do? They have women. They have women fighting. And the Germans were cowed by that. That is, as, as, uh, as tough as they were, you know, those uh, German soldiers, uh, battled, worn and scarred. They, they, they couldn't conceive of a, of, a, of a war where women didn't have fighting. That just absolutely horrified. The idea that you'd have to kill women, you know, I mean, in, in, in warfare. Um, I mean, the Germans were reputed as being savage and all right, that. Right. That's, no, uh, no, that, was, that's there's, there's a lot. It was beyond their imagination. Yeah. The Russians did that. And now, alas, it's become a commonplace. And <clears throat> I don't know how many uh, uh, people have said about the Vietnamese War that the children were involved. That is, mm -hmm. that uh, there are those terrible stories where Americans would come into a village and... Uh, just machine gun down the women and the children, and and their defenses. Well, those women and children had uh, had hand grenades uh, frequently, uh, as you didn't know who the soldiers were and who the soldiers were. In the Trojan War, that's very clear. Andromache is not going to go out to that battle. Hector is going to go out to that battle. Uh, well, this this is a uh, this is a classic uh, this is a classic scene, and I think. Perhaps we've said it before that uh, it's been repeated. Uh, people who have written stories have repeated the story over and over again. It's a, it's a conflict uh, between men and women. Uh, women. Women are pacifists. Women don't like war. Right. And, well, and, and I was going to say men don't like it either, but that's not altogether true. No, they do. They uh, do. Men do like war. Uh, they, uh, they, they often say they don't, and they they often get uh, disgusted with it and horrified by it and fed up with it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and they're uh, they're very glad when it's over, but when it's over, then they're not so glad that it's over. But Achilles yeah. isn't happy uh, <laughs> sitting there outside the battle. Oh, he, no. he's, oh, he's, no. he's, he's, he's looking all the time. Oh, you know, he, he keeps walking out to see how the battle is <laughs> going, and he won't sail away and go home. Uh, no. uh, oh, I bet you could pick out a hundred passages from the Iliad alone where Homer says, oh, he says it over and over again, how how glorious the war is, you know. And the old men, old Priam, for example, wishes he were younger. Oh, he says, if only I were uh, in my, <laughs> make a pun, in my prime, <laughs> in my prime. Uh, well, I would, I would be there in, the, in a blaze of glory. Uh, that, that's just said over and over again. No, I, I think we have to say it. Men, men love war, and they're unhappy without it. Uh, and women hate war. And uh, they want they want peace. Uh, one of the words we use for the scene is it's a domestic scene. Uh, the wife, and the child, and the nurse. Uh, it's I suppose it's really the only domestic scene in the poem. Really, this is the domestic scene. Uh, this is the, uh, the the family. You see, and and of course. Uh, the Trojans, uh, all of their families are there within the walls. Yeah, the Greeks are, are back home. Uh, all their, their, all their families are back home. Uh, they, they yearn for their families, but here, all of their families are there, and so you, you, uh, you realize that the Greeks are, uh, that the, uh, it, it's the, it's this domestic life uh, that the Greeks are going to, uh, going to disrupt. I wish I could find. There's a, uh, a scene that I I can't. I'm going to have trouble locating a, a scene that simply describes the uh, the uh, what happens when a when a battle begins, uh, and it is it is really uh, glorious. There's no other way of describing it. That is uh, just the sound and the activity and the bustle and the excitement of it is obviously. Is that where um, he uses those great thrilling. metaphors? Where uh, the, uh, I think so. Where I, uh, the, uh, he, he has just uh, I can't remember which famous battle. similes where yeah, yeah. Uh, he says, and then it was like yes, such and such and yes, such. And, such. That's right. and they build up. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, it, there's no question about the it's excitement like, of that. It's, it's like a Beethoven symphony. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah exactly. Uh, that's the passage I'm trying to find. Yeah. But, uh, and, and as I say, uh, very often uh, the soldier who no longer has uh, anyone to fight uh, is a man who has lost his reason for living. Uh, Achilles uh, has been, and Hector, uh, they had been brought up uh, to be soldiers. 
and uh, it has become their life. And what will they do when there is no more war? Achilles, of course, is, is destined to die too. Uh, and he knows it very well. He, he knows perfectly well. He's, it's been told, uh, foretold, that if he, if he continues on in the war, he'll die. Uh, very young. And, um, um, but then, uh, and, and the, other, the other choice he has is to live a long life in peace. Uh, but what kind of a life would that be for Achilles? Um, but it's it, Achilles is uh, not. We don't mean to make Achilles some sort of special, strange, uh, unusual uh, kind of person. He's uh, he's in some ways he's simply a representation of all men who have a certain who take a certain delight in uh, in warfare. Well, those are hard words, aren't they? They're Today, hard. I mean, we we've come Very so far from what I remember. Uh, seeing a, a movie uh, a few years ago about General Patton, and uh, he was re he was presented as a kind of democratic man uh, living out of his time, and I suppose that was true. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's true. And <clears throat> at the end, toward the end of the movie, he uh, there's a line, and as I understand it, these were quotations, actually uh, true quotations from General Patton himself. He was talking to General Bradley, who was much more of an oligarchic. Uh, man, much more of a typical modern general, uh, who was promoted over Patton uh, and far his inferior uh, in terms of military uh, glory, uh, the old-fashioned definition of a general. But he got promoted over Patton because he was more efficient with the machine and, and learned how to get along more with, of a uh, uh, company, company, company man, man uh, yeah. you know, with the middle management and all that kind of thing. Uh, and at the end of the movie, uh, uh, Patton still thumps him on the back and says, uh, God forgive me, but I love war. It's a, it's a famous quote. I think actually where, where the scene occurs, it's even more dramatic than that. He's out, uh, he's out uh, viewing a, a battlefield. Oh, it's, it's earlier on. Yeah, it's yeah. earlier on. Uh, there's been a, 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 a company, a, 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 I don't know, I remember what you call them, a company of tanks has engaged in a battle uh, out in the desert and uh, they were annihilated. Uh, it was a trap of some sort. They were destroyed by Rommel. And you get a vivid uh, uh, panorama of this scene, of uh, dead bodies and uh, jackals out there and Arabs out there, uh, you know, uh, stealing things from the dead bodies and all of these smoldering ruins of tanks. It's a scene of complete desolation, exactly what you see on a battlefield. And it's then uh, that he says, you know, he looks at it, and of course he's very aggrieved uh, that all of this has happened. Uh, he's stricken by it, but then he says, you know, God help me, I love it. Mm. Uh, he says, I, I can't help it. Yeah. I'm a soldier. Yeah. And uh, he doesn't mean he loves all these people being dead. <laughs> he doesn't mean that. No, but uh, he means <clears throat> that it's, it's warfare itself. Yeah. But uh, the. Uh the horror of war that we suffer today is in part due to the mechanization of war. I, I think again, yes, we have to say there's a great truth in modern pacifism uh, because uh, wars have lost their glory. Uh, there really wasn't any Homer of World War II. Uh, people kept saying, isn't there going to be a great poet who will come out of this war after all, there were, I won't say great poets, but there were certainly very good poets who came out of even World War I, yes. who wrote very moving, touching uh, war poetry with, with, with a touch of glory. But uh, out, of, uh, out of World War II, not a single poem. No. Not a single one. No, we got a bunch of novels, really. Yeah. Of, uh, rather, rather uh, pessimistic and rather dirty mm -hmm. novels. Not, like, not much good either. Not much, like *The Naked and the Dead* oh, and, and things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, no, no. Patton also said in that movie. He's also quoted as saying, uh, "He's saying, I oh how I hate the 20th century." Yeah. He says, "I hate oh, the right. 20th century." Yeah. Uh, he means yeah. that uh, mm -hmm. you know he he looks back. He has kind of uh, portrayed as a kind of uh, visionary mm -hmm. who has. Uh, he remembers, uh, he, you know, uh, the, the wars of the past, 
and uh, that's where his heart is, is with the, uh, with the great wars of the past. Uh, he's a cavalry man. He's a cavalry man who really loves horses, and he's learned to fight with the tanks, because that's what you have to do. That's what became of the cavalry. It became tanks. But it's not the same. Uh, but it's not the same, and he doesn't think it's the same, uh, and, he, and he doesn't. Uh, like that kind of warfare, it's not really warfare. It's uh, it's uh, it's a it's a terrible modern perversion of warfare. I was saying the other everything. Of course, we feel that every that's happened to everything in the 20th century. I was saying in class the other day we were talking about people being crazy, uh, lunatics, and I was saying you know you know even even lunacy has been spoiled. I mean uh, you know in the 20th century you get a kind of madness which is. Uh, is disgusting. <laughs> there, there, it, it, there was a uh, there a kind of higher madness uh, before the 20th century. It's it's that everything has been touched uh, by the mechanization of the uh, of the 20th century. Uh, well, we've often said about the woman's question, for example, that <clears throat> one of the worst things that's happened is that women are now uh, in the armed forces. Uh, that women are are in business. Uh, they're they're out there in the, in the male world. There are lady lawyers. I mean, imagine. And anything can anything be more aggressive uh, than, a, than a lawyer? And, and I, was, I was talking to a law student just the other day, and he said, "Well, at least fifty percent of the students are, are women." And furthermore, he said, "They're better. That is, the men all are, are cowed by these uh, aggressive women." And and you uh, you get kind of horror uh, when you think about that uh, lady uh, ladies in business business executives uh, you see uh, I saw an advertisement of the paper the other day for office furniture and it had a picture of the ultimate in executive chairs and there was a woman <laughs> sitting in this executive <laughs> chair you know uh, talking on the telephone and obviously doing business with Swiss banks and that sort of thing. And you say, well, oh, why did they leave their homes? I mean, how, how could women have left their children, uh, their kitchens? Well, to take a look at the kitchen. Uh, it's, a, it's a piece of mechanism. It, it's, a, it's the same thing that happened to General Patton with his tanks. Uh, there, isn't, there isn't any kitchen anymore. There isn't uh, any home. There isn't any home. The whole place is... Uh, there's no reason why a woman would would love it. There's nothing there to love. Uh, Thomas Hardy speaks about the, the warm threshold. Uh, well, we, we, we all live in new houses. There aren't any warm thresholds. Uh, we have no homes. So, of course, the women are dissatisfied. They look around and they say, well, why should I, why should I stay there? And uh, to some extent, it is, it's the man. Uh, that is, uh, the men, uh, the men themselves are beginning to say, "Well, uh, I don't, I, I won't fight, really." No. Uh, that is, the men are very disappointing. Uh, there, uh, there's. Uh, the, uh, so, someone said Margaret Thatcher is the best man in England. Yes, <laughs> weakness. Uh, they detect weakness. Uh, I remember once a long time ago in a class, uh, I, I was. Uh, I can't remember what I was talking about, but I got to talking about men and women, and uh, I said, "What happens uh, when when a woman begins to feel that she can dominate uh, her husband?" And uh, and this was before the women's movement really got rolling, and but it was a, still a topic and subject. And some black girl, a very ordinary girl, she just she just spoke up. She said. Why he becomes a marshmallow? <laughs> just disgust, disgust. He just becomes a marshmallow. She said, and the class was just amazed. Well, she she, she knew. Are a little more old fashioned. They're, they're yeah. yes, they're more in touch yeah. with reality in that respect. They're, they're they behind that, the times because uh, they've been they've been deprived of the 20th yeah, century. Of the 20th century, yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's true, uh, men in a especially, of course, in a certain society, in a kind of decadent. Um, uh, oligarchy uh, becomes soft, uh, and they uh, they don't fight, and they uh, they're uh, they're not strong, and um, uh, and women want men to be strong. They want men to uh, to be uh, 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 aggressive and tough. Uh, they they need men to be that way, and if they won't be, 
Uh, if they don't feel that they're going to take care of their children, then by gosh, they'll take care of their children. And they become aggressive. And that's exactly what Andromache and, and Hector talk about there in that conversation. And Andromache admits he's right. Fine. Oh, yeah, well, she knows. She knows. She says it's true. What, what is her argument? <clears throat> her argument is that men get killed in, in war. And his argument is, well, if they don't, they have nothing to live for. Uh, I cannot face <coughs> you and, and my children if we were all slaves. That is, there are only, you, you see, there, isn't it true that uh, there is a, a philosophical problem involved in this? It does go back to the law of contradiction. Uh, there, there are people who seem to believe that you can make choices in such a way that if you say yes, there's no reason that you know. Uh, it's like that game we used to, uh, the, 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 the camp counselor says, everybody wins. You know, we will have a race, but, but everybody comes in first. Uh, if, you, 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 if you have winners, you're going to have losers. Uh, there, there, are, there are some people who think that somehow or other you can opt for peace, but then that you don't have to take the consequences of that, which is that you're going to be a slave. The only alternative to war is slavery. If you won't fight, there is somebody who will. And that is just simply the way of the world. Those dogs know that. <laughs> and there are people in universities who apparently don't. They somehow have the idea that if we're just nice, <clears throat> I can remember people uh, dealing with German uh, prisoners of war who would come up to the barbed wire and give them candy. And then they'd say, you see, you, you, you thought that we were awful, but we're really nice. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. If it weren't for that barbed wire, yeah. they would have been dead. And they didn't understand that. They thought that you could substitute candy for, for barbed wire. Oh, you can feed a, a German prisoner through the barbed wire as long as the wire is there. <laughs> but but, but they, they knew that, uh, that that was a weakness. Uh, they, they had contempt for that, just contempt. They, didn't, they, didn't, they wouldn't, to give them credit, they wouldn't take the candy. You know? <laughs> they, they were above that. Uh, well, they had some dignity. dignity you know, yeah, that kind of, not, not that they didn't want it either, you know, <laughs> yeah. because you do get starved for, for things, things as silly as that. Uh, when you're a prisoner, you know, you, you, you dream about it about chocolate and things like that. But, but they could see how contemptible that really was. Uh, but uh, uh, that's, a, that, that's something that, uh, as the 20th century moves to its close, now when, if Patton said, I hate the 20th century, well, that's a great phrase. <laughs> I, di I didn't know he said that. Yes, yeah. I must say, I've often said it myself. He He's may have said it in the older. modern world, I don't remember. <clears throat> I, I know myself, I've often said that. And, uh, he said the 20th in a way, century. I thought I made it up, but I suppose every, everyone feels the same way. It's a, it's a, it's a commonplace, uh, but uh, we, we, uh, we do live in, uh, when you add it all up, uh, a, a despicable retreat from, from Western civilization. Fr from, and that means from, from Hector, from Homer. I suppose we're winding down, aren't we now, toward the end of our yes. day? Yes. One of the things we ought to say as we get to the end is that this may be the greatest scene in the Iliad from a certain point of view. And Hector does seem to us almost like the hero of the poem at this moment. And yet, as great as he is, Achilles is, is, even, is even greater. Uh, we do have to come back to, to Achilles. And <clears throat> you know, one of the things that uh, we learn as we get older, us old men, uh, you, you, don't, you don't think about this when you're young. Those of you who read this poem and you're you're 20 years old or 25 years old, uh, you don't realize, as we do, how young these men are. Yes. Uh, that is, uh, war doesn't just kill men, it kills young men. That, that makes it even more poignant, more sad. And there's Hector, he's, he's, he just has, this, this, is their, child. this is their first child, this little baby, he's just a very, very young yeah, He's man. 25 years old. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, geez, the point, I mean, for us old men who sit there, with Priam, we're sitting up there, kind of helpless on the 
on the walls, and we look down and we see that, and and, and we say, oh, the the beauty of that, the the goodness of that, the, the wonder. I mean, Achilles has been given a choice in his life. You can go home and live out a long and happy uh, life as a farmer, as somebody who is exempt from the draft. <laughs> or you can take up arms, you can fight, and you will die. Uh, and Achilles is only uh, 25. Yes. And, he, and, and, he, and he makes the choice. <clears throat> that is, he, he, he chooses to, to fight and to die. Well, uh, they're, they're so full of life. Uh, these young men. That's that's what you always see about young men. Uh, you just see. I, I know. I see it. I, I stand in front of a class and I look at the young men out there and the young women too. You know. I just see that that uh, raw vitality. That force. That force. <laughs> that urge of vitality. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and you know, I, I say to myself, you know, there. I, I notice it because I don't have it anymore. You know, I, I'm lucky I can get there at all, much less. No, they can't uh, see that. They, they no, themselves. no, no, they don't see that in themselves at all. And to think of that, uh, you know, uh, being lost, you think it's a terrible thing. But then you say, you know, it isn't simply lost. It's something that is used. What, what does all that vitality go into? What, what are they going to do with that vitality? Are they going to uh, go uh, drink beer? Are they going to go dance? Uh, you know, do rock and roll music? Uh, are they going to sit and watch uh, football in front of a television screen? What are they going to do with that energy? Of <coughs> or, or get into a good uh, security program where they can retire early. <laughs> <laughs> this is, seems to be the alternative that people present to them today. Yeah, no, no, that's that's sad. That's sad. It isn't poignant. Uh, that's that's depressing. That's, depressing. Yeah, that's really uh, very depressing.